Hey everyone, this is Josh, and in this video, we're going to go through a quick run through of everything in Rust to help you get started writing programs for the Solana smart contract blockchain. I myself just personally started dabbling in Solana just recently. However, after playing around for a week or two now, I feel like I have enough information to give a quick functionality walkthrough for more experienced developers to quickly pick up Rust so they can start writing Solana smart contracts. First things first, what is Rust? Rust is a statically typed programming language that's designed for both performance and safety specifically in regards to concurrency and memory management. It's very similar to C++ and it's an open source project that's developed by Mozilla Research, i.e. Firefox. As you might imagine, if anything that's related to C++, Rust is used for low level system programming in scenarios where you want highly performant applications. If you're watching this specific video, the most important part of Rust is that it is the programming language of choice to write Solana smart contracts. So first to get started, we're going to install Rust in our IDE with Visual Studio Code. If you have all of this installed already, just look at the timestamps in the video and just skip ahead. The first thing we need to do is install Rust. So that's pretty straightforward. We go rustlang.org and then you just hit install and then download the exe if you're Windows. Download the installation exe in Windows or use curl to install the Windows subsystem if you have that. We'll actually be using that later on in the future. I'm not going to walk through this process. I'm sure we're all big boys and girls and know how to do this. Now that you have Rust installed, you need a tool to help you write code for Rust. My personal recommendation is Visual Studio Code. Go to code.visualstudio.com and download and install it. Now in my case, I already have it installed. One quick thing I would highly recommend once you have your Visual Studio Code open is to go to your extensions, which you also open by Control Shift X, and just look for some Rust extensions. Uh, specifically just the official Rust for Visual Studio Code. As you see, I already installed it. Highly recommend it. it. It helps catch syntax errors and gives code snippets that you can use. Now that we have our IDE set up, we can get started with writing our first Rust program. In Rust, there are two ways we can deploy our code. One is using the native Rust compiler, and the other one is using another tool called Cargo, which is similar to npm if you have ever used that for javascript before so to get started we're going to create a rust script first so we can just go to we can just create a new folder and i'll just make one it can be anything i'm just going to make a new folder right here and i'll just call out rust go here and so we'll be creating a workspace uh, yes i trust this folder so we'll be creating a workspace in this folder and so the first thing is I'll just go to file, new file, and I'm just going to paste it starting hello world code. Inside this folder, I'll just call it main.rs. And so this is the basic skeleton of a Rust script. Similar to other object oriented programming languages that you might know, such as Java and C, uh, there's a main function that gets executed by the program where you write your code. This is how you define a function in Rust. It's just fn for function, and the name of your function, your parameters, and then your code. We'll talk more about this later, but to build this code, you need your command prompt. Um, you can do control in the squiggly line, or you can just right click and then just click open and integrated terminal. This will display a terminal in your Visual Studio code, so it's very handy. And I'll just maximize the screen a bit. To compile your Rust script, you can just simply do rustc and then the name of your Rust file. So this will build and compile it. And as you can see, um, if I do a dir, as you can see, there's a new main.exe ha that has been created. And to execute the code, you just type in main.exe and then you see hello road. And this is the basic of writing, compiling, and running Rust code. This might work for a small application, but as you imagine, once we build bigger applications, we're gonna have a lot more files and a lot more dependencies to manage. And that's why Rust has something called Cargo. Cargo is Rust package management system. And like I mentioned earlier, it's very similar to NPM for JavaScript or pip for Python. And to create a Cargo project, it's pretty straightforward. Um, when you install Rust, Cargo should, actually, should automatically come with it. And to create a new project, you just need to, in your command prompt, type Cargo, new, and then just your project name. And so I'll just call it hello. And as you see over here in my folder directory, there's this new hello folder that I opened up. And if we quickly just go through it, you'll see that we have in our main RS, 
is extremely identical to the code that we wrote originally. Um, this is your basic hello world function. What I do want to bring attention to is this cargo.toml file. This essentially is your package management file. Think of this as your um, package.json for npm. In this file, we have information about our application that we're writing, and we can also list any dependencies that we want to download and install. In this video, we're not going to include any dependencies, but you can imagine later on when developing Solana smart contracts, you'll need to uh, have a dependency for all the Solana libraries that we need to use. To quickly build your application for Cargo, there's two ways. You could do Cargo build. Well, I need to go inside my new uh, Cargo project that I created. Okay, now if you do Cargo build, this is very similar to like an NPM run build. It just compiles and builds your code to make sure it works. And if you look inside the target folder and go inside debug, you'll see that this hello.exe has been created. Now, as you can imagine, this gets annoying because you have to build every single time and then execute the code. Now, if, if you want to compile the code and execute at the same time, you just type in cargo run, it'll build the code, and then it'll run it. And this is roughly all you need to know to get started building and writing a Rust application. Let's start actually diving into the code. So we'll go back to our main RS in our hello folder. It's very important uh, because we want to use cargo. I'm just close the old one. Before giving a quick overview of the variables, the first thing we need to know is how to print string onto the console. And for that, similar to Java actually, Rust has a println macro. Uh, this isn't a function I want to call out, it's a macro. And you can identify if something's a macro with the explanation mark. So Rust comes with these preset macros that will execute some code for you. And what println does is it prints onto the console the string that you give it, and then it creates a new line. Now, if you want to include variables, one unique thing about printing the console on Rust is that you actually need to give, if you want to include variables, you need to actually add these uh, open and close curly bracelets. And we'll just make some simple integers, um, nothing too hard. So we'll just create two integers, A and B, and you know, there's 10 and 15. And so println works kind of like a printf if you work in other languages. These curly braces represent a variable. And there are many different ways of representing them. This is the simplest. And so the macro takes in the string and it automatically looks to make sure that there is a, the exact amount of variables that you pass that corresponds to the uh, curly braces. So we just do A and B and then save. And then if you do a cargo run, you see that the hello road has 10 and 15. Now that we're talking about variable types, that'll be a good segue into uh, seeing how Rust handles variables. Our scalar types or our primitive variable types, we have four scalar types, or you can also think of them as primitive types. And those are our integers, which are two of. Uh, there's our floats, there's our characters, and there'll be booleans. So when looking at our integers, there are two types of integers. There are unsigned integers and there are signed integers. For those of you who are familiar with C and C++, you should feel right at home here. But essentially, a unsigned integer means the number cannot be negative. That's why it says it's unsigned. There's no sign. While a signed integer is a number that can be negative. And so in Rust, you define a variable by using the keyword let. You give it the variable name, and then you give it the type. But because Rust can actually dynamically infer what you're using, you don't actually need to even include the variable name. For example, if I just get rid of this, it would still work and compile. So just to dive into a bit of a finer point into the representation of this, we have U8, uh, which represents a unsigned integer that has eight bits. And so these numbers, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, these are the size we can store our variables in. Ideally, we want to use the smallest amount of bit possible to conserve the space features that we have. In this example, we're just using U8. So one thing to note is if I try to make this variable negative, you see that I get an error here saying that I can't you apply a, the unary operator in minus sign to type U8. It has to be positive. And likewise, if I try to make this variable bigger than eight bits, which I don't know the exact number again, but let's say a thousand, we get another error saying that 1000 is out of the range of U8. Um, oh, it says right here that range is from zero to 55. 
Now for the sign integer, it's exactly the same thing. Uh, you use I to represent signed. And then the number afterward is the number of bits that's uh, used. Now, if you look at the chart right here, uh, the one big difference between unsigned and signed integers is that in signed integers, the last bit is actually used to indicate if the value is negative or a positive number. So outside of that, it works exactly the same. Likewise, for example, over here, if I just make this number bigger, the range is from negative 128 to 127. And that's basically all we need to know about uh, integers. Next up is floats. Uh, floats are used for exactly one thing, and it's to represent decimals. So right here we have 1.2. Of course, it can be a whole number too if we wanted. Well, okay, fine. 1.0 if we wanted to be a whole number. And that's about all I have to say for floats. Next up, we have characters or chars. Uh, well, this code won't compile, but the chars are just essentially, you can think of just one character of a string. Uh, we'll talk about strings later, but this is not a string. I don't have much to say in Rust, except it represents the same character. Rust also supports Unicode, such as this, which is the happy face. And I'll even just run the code right here just to kind of see what the output is. So you see from our sign example, we already have the numbers that I printed. For the letter example, we have our C and we have our smiley face emoji. And of course, no programming language is complete without a Boolean, which is either true or false. So these are our scalar types, pretty straightforward and nothing too complex. Um, mathematical operations are the same. For example, if you want to add something, 10 plus 10 minus 30 times 50. Well, okay, these numbers are too big, but um, these are all the same. If you have any experience developing, uh, there should not be any surprise to you. Uh, Boolean is also the same. You can do true and false or true, for example. Now that we've gone through the scalar types, the other types of variable we have are compound types, such as arrays and tuples. And just go through a quick example of arrays. So arrays work exactly as you expect from most programming languages. Some things that you might get used to is, is how you define the array. Uh, here's an example. We have an array variable R, which is a array of U8 integers, and it has a length of three. And to create an array, uh, it's very similar to any other languages. Likewise, another way of quickly creating an array, and you could also use a similar syntax that we defined, that we used to define the array type. You include the number that you want to populate the array with, and then you give it the number to represent the length of the array that you want to create. Some of the most basic operation works exactly the same as any other language. Arrays in Rust are also zero-based indexing, and if we want to refer to a specific index, we just use the square braces like we do over here. And this gives the first element of our array. And if we want to get the length of the array, it's actually pretty similar to Python in this case, where we use the length function, which would give us the array. If we want to actually print out the whole entire structure of the array, we need to use a special syntax for our curly braces, this colon question mark, that will print everything out in the array. So if we run this application again, you see that our value at index zero is one, which is the case and that our other array has a length of five, which is indeed the case, so that's what we set. And then we look at the content of the other array, we see that we have an array of five 100s, which is exactly what we want to do. We will come back to talk a bit more about arrays later, specifically slices, which is an important concept for Solana smart contracts. However, I first want to go over the concept of pointers and memory management before we do that. Next up are tuples. And once again, I'll just paste this, make the screen bigger. For those familiar with Python, tuple is something that you might see commonly. Um, it's a data structure that holds two elements. In this case, in Rust, a tuple can actually hold unlimited amounts of elements, similar to an array. However, the difference is that a tuple can hold multiple elements of different types together. So for example, in this code right here, I have a tuple, and the tuple contains three elements, a integer, a Boolean, and a float. Alternative, we actually don't even have to define the type. We can let Rust figure it out and by just creating a tuple. Specifically to create tuples, you just use parentheses. And to access the data types in tuples, it's similar to array where you use the index, but instead of using brackets, you just use dot and then the index that you want. And of course, we can also print out the tuple. 
And one final thing to note about tuples is that you can do destructuring. If you worked in TypeScript before, this might be familiar to you. But essentially, all destructuring does is that you extract out the parameters inside your object, or tuple in this case, into uh, individual variables. So for example, A, B, and C will be, re be represented as 5, true, and 2.1. I'll print this code out, and we'll see that will be exactly equivalent. So we just do a cargo run. And you see that our first tuple over here is the equivalent of our the destructured variables. And so that's tuples in a nutshell. Next up is creating functions. So let's get rid of this. We already had a helper function over here. So what in this example, I want to return a function that given a number, we would return if it's even or not. So if we can just print out that value parameter and we'll just call is even and let's we'll give it a number and we'll say two um, which is indeed even so we can see that creating a function in rust is not too different from your statically typed languages you define your function name um, in this case by default all of rust functions are private unless you explicitly set the pub which makes it a public function in the parameters you receive it's formatted by the name of the variable and the variable type and then the type we return is represented by this arrow and then the return type. Now, what's interesting is if you look at the definition of this function, uh, what I did was to tell if a number is, we just look at the number in the single digit and we can do that easily by just modding the value by two. And then, and then I stored it in the digit variable. And what's interesting to note is in Rust, what, to signify that you're returning a variable, you would simply just write your statement and then not include the semicolon, as you see right here. In all instances, you need a semicolon to end your statement unless it is the return value of a function. So this is the return is even, or return bool. And so just for completeness, if our digit mod two is zero, that means that it just is even. And if it's not, then it has to be odd. And so if we just do a cargo run again on this, we can see that, oh, didn't save it, run it again. We can see that this returns true because two is even. And if we give it one, we can see that it returns false. And that's roughly all you need to know to define a function. Next, I want to talk about mutability. This is something a bit more Rust specific. So we're finally talking about something new. So in most languages, the variables that you assign, they are immutable specifically meaning that you can't change it. And that is actually still the case in Rust. However, Rust tightens that condition even more. Specifically, let's say if we have a number and we'll just call it five. In most languages, you can change your number to be another value and then that'll be it. However, in Rust, that is actually not the case. If you try to, if you try to run this code right here, you'll get, you actually, before you're running, you'll get an error. You'll see that you cannot assign twice to mutable variable num. To make everything run concurrently safe, Rust enforces variable mutability, which prevents you from being able to actually modify the data type. If you want to change a variable, you just use the keyword mute in front of the variable. This tells the compiler that you want to change your variable throughout your code. For example, maybe if you have an if statement and if following some condition, you want to have your variable be one thing, otherwise have it be something else. Uh, we see an error here and it's just saying that I never used the original value before I resigned it, but that's okay. We can ignore that and run the code. And of course I never save. All right. So as you see, uh, in our print statement, we print out the value three and that's basically immutability in a nutshell. All right, diving even deeper into some of the Rust mechanics, we're going to talk about arrays, slices, and the concept of ownership and borrowing. A quick thing about arrays, and later we'll talk about strings, is that let's say we make an array. In most modern languages, there's a concept of reference and a concept of value. So an array is a reference because we're not actually pointing to the value itself. We're pointing to the address and memory where the array is located on. So this is an array. So what is a slice? Well, a slice is actually a very similar thing to an array. Uh, a slice is also, so that's an array. So we already know what an array is, but what is a slice? A slice you can essentially think of is a subarray. 
So we can make this bigger. We can our variable called slice, and essentially, it can be something like uh, we want index. We want to create a subarray of index one all the way to index three, not counting index three. Um, so the first value is inclusive, and the last value is exclusive. So this would create us a subarray of one and two. And to create a slice, we need to dereference our array, like so. And now you see that risk quickly goes away. So you might ask, what exactly is the difference? The difference is that for an array, we know the length by compile time. However, for slices, we don't know the length. And that's roughly the only difference. So why am I talking about this? Well, in Solana smart contracts, the, a lot of the data that we pass in from the front end comes through a slice. So essentially, we're just given a random array of values that we don't know the exact length of. So from all the examples I looked at, what you had to do is you had to parse the slice that you get and get the and extract out the variables that you want to use. Not a fun process, but I found that there are existing helper libraries that help you do this. But that's in a much future video. But now, now that we have an array and a slice, I'll show you some of the differences in how you define them or re represent them in functions. So here's a helper function called uh, borrowing slice. It takes in two parameters. It takes in the original array that we created and the slice that we generated. And then we just do some pr simple printing. So like we mentioned, array, in array, you have to define the type and you have to define the fixed size of the... Uh, what meanwhile, if you look at a slice, the, the ampersand references the memory that our array is pointing to. And of course, we give it the type, which is U8. But because we don't know the length of it, we don't include the semicolon. So we'll just call this function, we'll pass in our array, and we'll pass in our slice. So what this code does is it will print out the value of our array, it'll print out the value of our slice, it'll give the length of our slice, because remember, a slice is exactly the same thing as an array. The only difference is that we don't know the length of the array in compile during the compile time. So we can still do things like reference specific indexes. We just need to know the length ahead of time. And so uh, right here, you see compile error because the length is not correct. Like I mentioned, the, ha the length has to be the same. So all I need to do is swap to six to a four and the error goes away. So for all that, let's run the code. So as you can see, our array is zero, one, two, and three. We got the slice from our first index to our second index because remember this, this, this three, index three is exclusive. And so that gives us a subarray of one and two. And remember, to get a pointer to our subarray, we need we always need to use this ampersand. And then finally, just to prove it to everyone, a slice does have a length function like an array. Um, it has a length of two, and you can still reference the indexes the same way. Just note that index zero is the first value of our subarray we created, which is one. So it's not tied to the index of the whole array. Next up, I want to talk a bit about strings. So at this point, you might notice we talked about individual characters in a string, but we haven't actually talked about how we can create a string in Rust. So naively, let's just get rid of all of this. We could create a string, and that can be something like her road, like so, in the string. And the type of this, actually, if, actually, if you just highlight, it'll tell you. It is a ampersand string. It's a string literal, or basically, this is actually similar to a slice. It's a string slice. Specifically, it is a reference to a space in memory that holds the constant hello road. Now, if we want to actually create a string, we can create a type string with a capital S. And this is actually an object or a structure that we have to create ourselves. Uh, we use a we use the string and string class as struct and that and then the two colons is used to reference a function from the class and we have a function called from and then we just type the string that we want to use or to create. So this create a string object that has a text hello road. This string type you can think of is equivalent to a vector. 
it is a dynamically sized array that you can keep adding more entries or remove from it. So there are a couple of things you can do from it with it. Uh, first thing is that if we want to get a slice, we can do the exact same thing with arrays. We just get the pointer of the string at a certain range of the array. So here's an interesting text that I might not have seen before. We have dot dot six, which means get everything from index zero up into index six, not including index six itself. So in this example would be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So it'll include the word hello in space. And, and just like a regular slice from an array, a string slice has the same basic function that a string has. It has, you can get the length of it. Now, the string class itself has a bunch of helper methods that's associated with. Uh, a couple that you, a couple useful ones are string dot push, which allows you to add a character. So that can only be like one letters. Uh, you can also do things like string dot push string, which get, allows you to put in a, if you look at this type, a, a string slice, which essentially is just a string. So this can be anything, hello road and I'll put an explanation mark space and Bob or something. Now you might notice that there's a red error and what's really nice is that it tells you what the error is and it says cannot borrow string as mutable. And what that is basically saying is that we can't modify our string because it is a immutable type. And we can easily fix that by just setting it to be a mutable type. And now the error goes away. Like I mentioned earlier, there's a whole bunch of methods that are associated with the string object. So that's how we add to a string. There are other helpful functions like string.replace. Uh, for example, we want to replace the word hello with bye, for example. Um, this function actually, if you look at the VS code, which is very helpful, actually returns a string. So what we need to do is we need to assign the result of this function call back into string itself. And so we'll just do a no print line. Let's see what we get. And we just pass in our string and we just save and then run. And then you see by road one, Bob, we appended the word one and then we added explanation Bob and then we replaced hello with the word by. The string class has a lot of functions available to it, more than I can quickly cover in here. So do look at the documentation you can quickly find by Googling it and you'll get all the help you need. Now that we have an understanding of some of the most common variable types used in Rust, let's look at some of the flow controls that's available. As you might expect, they're not really any different from, from other languages. We have our if statements, our for loops, while loops, switch statements, and so on and so forth. So I'll just make this quick. So first example is we have our if statements. It's exactly as you imagined it. Let's say it's kind of like a Python style. In this if statement, we just have a variable. If the, uh, if the variable is greater than zero, we print that it's greater than zero. If it's less, we print that. Otherwise, it has to be zero. So very straightforward, uh, exactly as you imagine from a typical if, else, if, and else statement. So if I just compile the code and we see that three is greater than zero, which makes sense. After this statement, we have a for loop. I would also say the for loop in Rust is very similar to Python. Um, we see the format here that we have for i in, and then uh, this symbol, which, which creates array with the values zero all the way up into five. This range always excludes the last value that you set. In the case of Rust, the for loop always traverses through an array that we generate, as opposed to what you might commonly see in other languages like Java, C Sharp, where you can explicitly just set a value and then set a, a range that you want to iterate through. So in this instance, our code will print values from zero to five. So as you can see, we go from zero all the way to five. Next up, we have the while loop and we'll just paste it again. So just like any while loops in other programming languages, you have, you find while, and then you give the condition that you want to follow 
and the code will continuously execute until that condition has been met. In this instance, let's just say that uh, we have our i value, and then when i is less than four, we just print a statement and then we increment it. And so just to be a little bit different, we can also say if i equals three, we'll just print out the value first, or we can just print out uh, exit, and we can do something like um, break, which would immediately terminate the while loop and exit the function. And this works the same for for loops too. Alternatively, there's also continue, and that works the exact same way as you would expect from a normal continue. It would just skip the execution of this specific iteration and move on to the next one. If you have break, similar to returning a value in a parameter, you don't include the semicolon. So if we just save this and execute our code again, we'll see that we have 0, 1, 2, and then we exit. And that's more or less the while loop. And the final flow control is the match flow. Uh, in other languages, this is your switch statement. You give it the parameter that you want to match, and then you, you find the specific cases that you want to match, and then the code that you want to execute with the case. In this code here, right here, if we have zero, we just print out the word zero. If the value is either one or two, uh, the value being i, we just print out one and two. And we can also do a range. Um, so over here, so we do three and dot dot equals four. We've seen the syntax before, it's what creates a range. So three is the inclusive and usually four is exclusive, but because we have this equals right here, it's now a inclusive range from three to four, which is what we print out. And then finally, if none of the cases match, we can use a, a underscore to be our catch all case, which is our default. So in this code right here, we execute it, we should just run, we should bring our default, correct. And to prove my last point, if we set four, we show that it is inclusive. So there you go, three and four. There are some more complex cases that we can use matches for, but essentially the logic is the same. You pass in the variable that you're matching, and then you just define the cases that you want to write code for. Next up, I want to talk about structs. For those familiar with C and C++, structs should be already very familiar to you. But those who are not, you can essentially think of them as classes. Let's get rid of this. The a classic example of structs, we can just use uh, create animals. So in the case of rest, let's create a bird. Um, this is how you would define a struct. You just reuse the keyword struct, create the name of the class you want, and then you just define the field. So let's just give it the name. It just has the field string. If you want multiple fields, you just give it a comma and then put in the next field. So maybe the game, it has an attack or something and we give it a, an integer value. To be able to implement methods into your struct, you simply use the keyword implement or impla, and then you give it the struct that you want to add the implementation for. And then inside this bracket, you just define all the functions that you want. So maybe one is for name. What's interesting for this is that you have to define yourself uh, similar to how you would Python. People familiar with JavaScript, uh, this might be a reference to this, which references the instance of the struct that you create. And so the, every function that we write will have a pointer to, so inside this function, we'll just do a print lin and just give the name of the bird. One nice thing I'll point out for those familiar with C++ is that normally when you have a pointer to an object, you need to do an arrow function such as this to reference the parameter. But in Rust, that's actually all automatically handled for you. So you can treat everything the same, which is pretty nifty. So this is the basics of creating a struct inside Rust. So we can just quickly use it. Create an instance of a struct, it's pretty straightforward. You create a normal variable and then you write down the struct type. And then inside brackets, you have to define the type for all of your fields. So that can be name, bird, and its attack is, I don't know, let's say five. Now this red is wrong because uh, once again, this, this string is not actually a, uh, the type string. It's actually a string slice that we're creating, but that's not accepted. And so we can quickly rectify by creating a string. 
And this will give me the opportunity to talk about another useful uh, functionality of Rust. We just create another string. We create another variable called name, and we just do a string from and put bird. Similar to JavaScript TypeScript, if the parameter you're trying to use is the same as the name of the field that you're trying to populate, you, you can shorten everything and just pass in the name of the variable like so. Alternatively, this is fine too. Uh, now that we have a now that we have an instance of our bird struct, we can just use it. Uh, so we can just call bird dot uh, name, and then now we run the code. We'll see that we'll print the name of the bird, which is just bird, which you see right here. And that's basically structs in Rust in a nutshell. Now that we know how to create structs or classes, the next question is how do we do object-oriented programming? The interesting thing about Rust is that Rust actually does not support inheritance, where you extend a class. It only supports interfaces. So in Rust, how we handle interfaces is we use something called traits. I'm just going to paste for the sake of time. So you define a trait by using the keyword trait, and then you give it the name of the trait that you want for other classes to implement. So a bird is an animal. And so we'll say animal has two methods that we want to implement, uh, can fly and is animal. Just like a normal interface, you can create a function that has been implemented by the class that's extending it. So in this instance, we have can fly. The method signature doesn't take in any parameters. It just has the instance. It just references itself and it returns a boolean. We can also add a default implementation, such as what we have with is animal, uh, same method signature and return type. We can actually implement the method, which returns true. Of course, when we do extend it, we can overwrite it. To extend the, a trait, all we need to do is use the implement keyword again, and we just implement the trait animal for the bird struct. And then if you read the error, it'll probably say that we are missing implementation of can't fly. So all we need to do is implement it. Let me easily do that by pasting. And we just return true. And that's it for implementing our trait. Now to show everything works, we can just do print then bird dot can fly and bird dot is animal. Then we run it. We can see that we return true true for both. And to be complete, I'll also overwrite the is animal function for us. So as you see, I set is animal to false. So now we call the code again, we'll get true false. And that's everything you need to know about object oriented programming with Rust. After structs, we have enums. So now in most languages, enums are just objects that represent a certain value. That's the same case for Rust. However, Rust is a bit more interesting in that these enums can actually store additional values. So I'm just gonna paste an example. So here's the my enum type that I created. Syntax exactly the same. You have a enum and then you give the name. So there are three enum values that I've signed to my enum. It's A, B, and C. A is just uh, the value A by itself. B, interesting enough, you actually store the value, the integer inside of it. And C is you can also store a struct like object. So in this case, C has the two fields X and Y, which are both integers. And what you see up here is essentially an attribute that tells that tells the compiler how to print your enum, which is going to be relevant because we'll be printing it soon as such. So if you look inside our main function, we are using our enums. We have our variables A, B, and C. To create an enum, you just call the enum class that you created. And then you do double colon to reference the field. And the field in this instance is A. Likewise, if we want to instantiate a B type with a certain integer, we just do colon colon B and then we give it the type. And for our C type, which we have a struct, we do something very similar. We do colon colon C and then the open and close brackets. And inside of that, we just define our X and Y value. So we just do a quick print of these values. You'll see that these are what our enum represents. So one way to extract the value of our enum is to use if statements. This isn't your typical if statement. Uh, what you see right here is if let your enum my enum b and then the value equals c. 
And what this really is saying is if our, well, not C, but our B, if our B type is a enum B, val represents our variable that we stored, and then we can just print it. Likewise, if our C is a C enum, then we access the fields of our C enum, X and Y, and then we can just print it. And then if we run cargo run again, we see that we print out our new types, our five that we stored and our 10 and 20 X and Y value. And so that's roughly enums on a high level. Next, I want to talk about the standard library that's available in Rust. The first classic example is a vector or a dynamic array. Depending where you come from with languages like Python and JavaScript, arrays are already dynamic and you can increase and decrease it. Now to define a vector, and just like any other statically typed languages, you just define the parameter you want to. And to create a vector, there are a couple of ways, but the easiest way is we use the keyword vec with the exclamation mark, which means we are using a macro that Rust provides us. And to create the vector, we do the, we can initialize it the same way we do with an array. We can explicitly define the value in each index, or we can even provide a range, for example, from zero to five. So let's just do one, two, three, four, five. A vector is pretty much the same as an array, except that its size can be dynamically altered. But as you see, we still have some of the existing functions. We still have our vector.lane. We can get the value at whatever index we want to. The major difference is that we can now add and remove elements. So we can do something like vector.push, and then this won't work exactly quite yet, but we can push in the number six. And this fails because we're trying to modify a unmutable object or a immutable object. So we can easily rectify that by using, adding the mute keyword. So this would push six and we can also use the remove function and maybe we can remove the first index, which would be our one. And then we just print our results. We run our code. And we see that we have two, three, four, five, six. We added the six to the end and we removed one from the list. This is a basic introduction to a vector. If you want to learn more about it, check out the documentation. The other commonly used data structure next to the vector is the map. So for those not familiar, maps are basically objects that allows you to store data in a key value pairing. You use the key in your map to associate a value to it. So here's a quick code example. I'll just paste it. A hash map in this instance, unlike a vector, you actually have to import from the standard library. And so looking at the example, it's create a variable map. We make sure it's mutable and we just define the hash map. We call the hash map object, and then we call the new function to create an instance of a hash map. So operations for hash map is pretty straightforward. There's typically three things. You have your insert, your get, and your remove. In this instance, our hash map takes in a number as a key, and then as the value, we store a string slice. Then this code will print to show you what the value is. To retrieve the value, well, it's actually, it's pretty interesting. Uh, unlike in other languages, when you retrieve an object, if you look at the definition of get, you see that right here, it returns a option type, not the actual value that you're storing. The options contains the value. I'll quickly talk about option in another example, but uh, essentially in this instance, option you can think of as a enum with two values. It's either sum or none. So uh, basically a success type or a failure type. It's similar to optionals in Java if you've worked with it, or potentially kind of like promises in JavaScript where something could be successful or you can have an error. So in this instance, we use the our match flow control or our kind of switch statement, and we retrieve the value that's stored at the key zero. What's interesting in hash map is that we actually don't want to pass in the value of the number. We actually just want, we always want to pass in the pointer to the value. In our instance, if we do get sum, the value from sum is stored as a parameter. We can call it anything. I just call it string, but this can be string one. And it'll still be fine. And so if we get something back from our get, as in the key and value exists, we just print out the value. Otherwise, if we get none, we just print that doesn't exist. And to show an example, I will also call get to find a key of two, which doesn't exist. 
And finally, to remove a key value pair, it's pretty straightforward. We just call map that remove, and we just give the pointer to the number. And I'll print it out to showcase that. Do cargo run. You see that initially our map is zero is paired with high, and one is paired with high two. And then when we print out the value at key zero, we get high. But when we try to print out the value associated with key two, it doesn't exist because we need to write it in. And then if we remove the key value pair of zero, we see that all that's left in our hash map is our one key. And that's basically hash maps. As usual, there's a lot of other functionalities available that you can see in the documentation, but this is the high level we need to know to get a hash map work. Next up is options. We already talked about options when we try to retrieve a value from our map, as you can see right here. So to formalize everything, here's another example. A option essentially is an enum that has two types. It has none, which if consumed, uh, rest will automatically throw an exception. And it also has a sum type, which stores a value. The value can be anything. It's just something we put inside of it ourselves. So in our example, we have a function called divide. Divide takes in a dividend and a divisor, and then we would return a option, as you see right here. A So in this function, it's straightforward. If our dividend mod or divisor is not zero, that means that we cannot divide this number evenly. We would just return the none type. Otherwise, we return the sum type, and the value would be the number that we divide. So now to quickly use this, we will get rid of our implementation and I'll just paste some helper code I had beforehand. So we have two pieces of code, divide one, divide two. The divide one, we call, we get the option from divide when we pass in four to be divided by two. And for divide two, we do, we get the option of two divided by three. So there are a couple of ways of extracting out the value. The first way we already saw when we use the match statement to see, to get the value. The second way we can call a unwrap function on the code. So unwrap will return the type that's expected of the option. Quickly run that. We'll see that uh, our object that we get the by one is a type sum two. And then once we unwrap it, we get the value two. Now, the reason why I commented out us unwrapping our second option. It's because if we unwrap a none type, it would throw a panic and a panic is Rust's version of a exception. So with this code, we, if we were to do cargo run, we would crash during our runtime. We would get a runtime exception. Seeing here that uh, we panicked when we unwrapped a value, that we unwrapped a option that has a none type. There are some other interesting ways of I'm wrapping the value, but this is options in a nutshell. Next step is results. Results are very similar to options. Instead of an option where we have a type or none, we have a okay and a error type. And the error type can be anything, specifically it can be under I32. Or specifically in this case, I'm going to use a enum called my error, and it returns a error one type. So specifically, I'll just add a my error enum type to be return value of our result. The specific syntax that we see up here is an attribute. Essentially, it's telling the compiler to figure out how to print out the error type of our enum when we try to print the message. Now to define our result type, a result has two types, or enum specifically, an error and an OK. An error is essentially an enum that contains basically any error message. It can be an integer, it can be a string, it can be your own custom type that you define. And then there's also an OK type, which contains the value that you return if it's successful. So in our divide function, we previously we just returned none when our number is not divisible. However, maybe we want to actually throw an error. And so to do that, we would just return error, and then in our error type, we just throw our enum in, which is my error, and then error one. 
And then for our success, we just return a OK value with the whole number. Now we get to the interesting part of using the function, the result type. So here's some code. So we call it divide with uh, four divide by two, and we store that value inside of it. We'll call it divide. One way of accessing the type safely is to just do a match statement and then see that if it's okay, we just print out the divided value. Otherwise, if we get an error, we just print out the error, which as you can see is this, is this object. So that's one way, but potentially that could get really nested. So another option we can do is we could use an if statement and wrap our divide and check to see if our divide is okay. And if it's okay, we can safely unwrap the value. Of course, we could just do what we did earlier and just directly unwrap it. And that would work out fine. If there's an error, it would just print the error. Otherwise, we just print the value. Now, some interesting application that you can use is this unwrap or function. And what this does is it will unwrap the value that we store in divide. So for the divide by two is two. And if somehow we return an error instead, we'll just print out 100 instead. And to showcase this, I'll do for the divide by three. And you see that we print out 100. So that's one of the many ways of actually extracting out the value. Now, another thing we could do is if there actually is an error, you can use this expect function that I have up here. And what expect does is if it gets an error type, then it will it'll print a statement. In this case, we'll just print out the string we crashed. Oh, oh, it's not divide two, it's just divide. Now if I run this again, you see that we get an error saying that it'll be crashed. However, if it is a valid value and we print it, we can safely print out our two, as you can see right here. If you stuck with this video up until this point, congratulations. I think you should have a relatively strong understanding of Rust now, um, at least hopefully more than you had when you started. My hope is that this will help introduce you to Rust and some of its syntax and how things work and give you the knowledge and information to dive deeper and learn more about Rust. However, I think with some of the things that we talked about from defining variables to creating structures to using our standard library, you now have a strong understanding. We can now look into Solana programs and understand what is roughly happening in the code. If you found this video helpful, please hit the like button and subscribe. In my next video, I'll be going over a Hello World Solana program and start our adventure into developing a Solana smart contract. Until then, I'll catch you later.